Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's first session. Um, this is going to be an interesting one, and I would like to start with a little history here. So this year, 120 years ago, uh, a young 20-something chemist student left his hometown in Budapest in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and his name was John von Neumann. Later, he became known as the father of modern computer. One of this, his concepts was the concept of singularity which is a hypothetical point in the future when artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence, leading to profound and transformative changes in society. This topic is more relevant than ever, as we might see it unfolding right in front of our eyes. Today, we are incredibly lucky to have Christopher Penn, a true powerhouse in the marketing world, and who also happened to be a captivating international keynote speaker, lucky us. Um, and uh, he has expertise spanning across multiple domains, including marketing industry, um, analytics, um, digital marketing, uh, data science, uh, machine learning. So he's also co-founder of and the chief data, data scientist of uh, trustinsights.ai. Uh, they influence Google Analytics adoption to uh, data, uh, also data-driven marketing, AI machine learning uh, in the marketing realm. He has collaborated with prestigious brands like Twitter, T-Mobile, Citrix Systems, McDonald's. He's truly one of the top influencers of the marketing industry. So prepare to be inspired and enlightened about the singularity, which might end marketing uh, as we know it. Hi, my name is Christopher Penn, co-founder and chief data scientist at TrustInsights.ai, and this is the Intelligence Revolution. <clears throat> For, first of all, quick warning, the AI space is moving really fast. So if you're watching this presentation after June 19th, 2023, there's a good chance the information in it is outdated. <clears throat> you can't go more than two seconds without someone bringing up artificial intelligence, uh, generative artificial intelligence technologies like chat GPT, for example. It's all the rage. It's pretty much what everyone's been talking about since November of 2022. <clears throat> you've, if you're not familiar, this is what chat GPT looks like. Uh, it is a pretty straightforward interface. You just type in and have discussions with it. And it is one of a family of different generative technologies. <clears throat> this, for example, is Google Bard, uh, which is Google's uh, generative AI tool for having uh, discussions and asking questions. <clears throat> Google also has what's called SGE, Search Generative Experience, where you can see you can ask questions of search results. You have, of course, Microsoft Bing which is uh, Microsoft's uh, search engine now with generative AI capabilities. And there are even standalone desktop utilities. This one's called GPT for All that use open source models, <clears throat> technologies, and software to give organizations and people the same uh, access to the same technologies without necessarily working with a uh, technology vendor service. <clears throat> when we're talking about models, we're talking about AI, the word model really just means software. In the same way that Microsoft Office and Microsoft Word are pieces of software written by humans for human use, models are AI software written by AI for AI use. So just keep that distinction in mind when you hear people talking about all these AI models. <clears throat> it's really just software. And that's important because people will kind of mix up the interfaces to models with the actual models themselves. The interfaces are things like ChatGPT and Bing and Bard. Models are the less cleverly named things like GPT 3.5 Turbo, Stable LM, Vacuna, MPT 7B Story Writer. Very complicated, you know, not so marketing friendly names. The reason you need to know this is so that you understand when someone's talking about a tool, what tool and what model they're using because different models give different results. So what is a large language model? Let's talk through this really quickly. The, you know, everything begins with uh, this phrase from John Hooper Firth, a linguist back in 1957, who said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. This is the essence of all natural language processing because machines can't read. They can't comprehend. They can't understand. They can only <clears throat> understand probabilities. 
For example, with language, a word's meaning can change based on another word. Here, if I talk about I'm brewing the tea, uh, it should be pretty clear what I'm doing. I'm taking a, a some dry leaves, pouring hot water on them, and making a beverage. Now, if I say I'm spilling the tea uh, in, in sort of uh, English gossip, this means I'm gossiping, right? This is sort of slang. I'm gossiping. So the word spilling changed the meaning of the word tea. And so you can see how these probabilities would change based on uh, uh, what the words are nearby. And that's how these models work. Essentially, what they do is, well, I mean, this is sort of the unhelpful system diagram, but what they do is they take enormous amounts of text. These companies who create these models create enormous amounts of text gathered from all over the web, whether or not they have permission to do so. And they ingest this and they and and they look at the probabilities of words and phrases and sentences to each other. For example, here it says I'm brewing the tea. And you can see near these near this phrase, there are words like taste and smell and coffee uh, and so on and so forth. That's how these models learn. They learn based on the probabilities of what's nearby. When you take something like those reviews and these these companies that are building these models, they are just taking all of these words, assigning them numerical values, and then looking at the statistical distribution of these words near other words. So that's how these models work. They're huge libraries of probabilities. There's no actual words in them. They're just probability libraries. So when you type in a sentence like, I'm brewing the, the model has to look at what you've written around it and then try to make its guess as to what it what the next logical word or phrase or sentence would be if you mentioned oolong previously it would select tea if it, you mentioned starbucks previously somewhere uh, it, it would probably select coffee if you mentioned karl marx it might mention the fall of capitalism but that's how llms work is they look at what is nearby and attempt to guess based on their known probabilities from huge amounts of text what the next words and phrases in, in the sequence are. The process for getting these models to do what we want is a programming language, a programming technique called prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is writing in plain English the, what we want a machine to do and then having it do it. And by the way, I, Substitute the language of choice here because these models do work in many, many different languages, including some languages that you don't really see anymore, like Sumerian. Again, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. If I type a prompt like this, write a short paragraph about marketing automation software. There aren't a lot of words in that prompt. And as a result, what the machine spits out is pretty bland, right? It's pretty bland because the machine didn't have much to work with. So it's going to look at the highest probability terms for the very few words that I specified. And you end up with some very generic text, you know, marketing automation software streamlines, automates and measures marketing tasks and workflows, et cetera, et cetera. If I add more detail, if I say, write a short paragraph about marketing automation with a focus on the Modic open source marketing automation platform found at modic.org, now you can see that there are new words and phrases. There are new terms because we've gave, given the model more starting probabilities, right? We've used uh, open source, we've used marketing automation platform. And so the model can now come up with better language because it has more refinement. Now, if I give it a really detailed prompt, I say, you'll act as a business writer. You have knowledge of marketing, particularly B2B marketing. Write up a short paragraph about marketing automation software with an emphasis on Modic, the open source marketing automation platform. Focus on reduction of churn and increased audience loyalty. Include details about Modic and lead scoring. Write in a warm, professional tone of voice. Write at 12th grade readability level. Browse modic.org for current details. <clears throat> this is giving a model guardrails. See? With all these words, all these probabilities, it's going to create a much, much better, more specific, less generic, less bland piece of content because I've written a prompt that is incredibly detailed. Here's the key takeaway when it comes to prompt engineering. The more relevant words you use, the better your prompts will perform. And those relevant words should be very specific, right? If, if your industry has jargon, Use the jargon in your prompts because that helps a model narrow down things much, much faster. Prompt engineering right now is probably one of the hottest professions. It's not going to last very long, maybe a year or two. But if you are in a position to be doing it, 
Right now, it pays very, very well. The other thing to keep in mind is that all these different models that are out there are like different software packages, different operating systems, right? What works on Android looks a lot like what works on iPhone, but they're different operating systems and things are not one-to-one. -one. The same is true for large language models. What works in chat GPT will not necessarily work as well on Bard or Bing or GPT for all. That said, again, it, you know, generally speaking, the more relevant words you use in a prompt, the better it will perform regardless of the system. But there are specifics that are unique to some systems. For example, this is the architecture of a good prompt for chat GPT. There's a whole bunch of stuff that is built into the way chat GPT works based on the developer documentation. <clears throat> and so if you follow this structure, you'll get really good results. You can download this, by the way, for free, no strings attached, no forms to fill out, no information gathered. Go to trustinsights.ai slash prompt sheet for that. <clears throat> so let's talk about use cases. Now that we have an understanding of these models, look at the way we can use these models. There's six broad categories, generation, extraction, summarization, rewriting, classification, and question answering. Generation, we're all familiar with, right? You're a business blogger, write a blog post outline describing the advantages of the modic marketing automation platform versus HubSpot. And of course, it's going to go through, say it's you know open source, there's customization, integrations, it's affordable. We know generation. These models are, are good at generating stuff. Another example, given a list of technical requirements, write a privacy policy for a website. And this is going to do a very good job of this kind of task. This is almost commodity content. Now, you will still want to have a human lawyer fact check this stuff because you don't want to leave <laughs> the potent things that potentially cause liabilities purely in the hands of machines. But this is a great way to speed things up. As a short aside, if your business is one that bills by hour uh, for knowledge work, you need to change business models really, really fast. Another example, given a an outline of tasks, you can have these tools generate code. Um, obviously, Chat GPT does this. Google Bard does this. Uh, Bing does this to some degree, but Bard uh, is a little bit further ahead. And there are even specific models like GitHub Copilot that will that are focused on on generating code. The second set of categories is extraction, taking information and extracting it from, from source content. Here's a real simple example. I gave um, one of the models a description of my company and said, extract some SEO keywords from this. Uh, infer what those keywords might be. And of course, we have a whole bunch of uh, different keywords, that, including some that are not in the original text, but it understands these are the terms that would be relevant to this kind of company. Uh, a, a very popular one, you are an administrative assistant skilled at taking unedited transcripts of conference calls and turning them into meeting notes and action items. I use this one all the time. Anytime I'm doing client work, I have, uh, with permission, uh, recordings of the client calls, and then those get transcribed into raw transcripts, which, you know, uh, transcripts are, can be kind of messy. And then I use one of these tools to distill it down into just the meeting notes and action items. It is a huge time saver. It is a huge labor saver, and it's a great way to give better customer service to clients because <clears throat> we remember what we was said in the meeting and who is responsible for what. We can even use these tools to extract information. So I took a recent email I sent from my instance of Modic, and I said, extract the clickable links from this page. And so from my preview page in my marketing automation system, it extracted all the clickable links in order so I could see uh, how many links were in there. So that's extraction. The third category is summarization, and this is another huge category where these models really stand out. <clears throat> this is some, an example of some executive coaching. I did about 15 interviews, uh, long transcripts of interviews with people and about their organization and said, okay, let's distill these down now and using a large language model distilled it down into a single mission statement. Now, this is powerful because this is taking all of their words and perspectives, putting them all together. And, and blending them without me interjecting my point of view or my opinion about their organization. It's just using their words. Uh, and it's, as a result, you tend to get things like mission statements that are a lot more agreeable to the participants because they recognize it's their words. <clears throat> Another very powerful example, uh, the voice of the customer. Uh, I'm having it write social media content from their five-star reviews on this company's uh, Google uh, business pages. This is my martial arts teacher's school. 
as marketers, we have a tendency to, again, have a point of view and an opinion about what our business is good at, our features and stuff. But realistically, our customers are probably the best source of that information. So I took their uh, reviews, those five-star reviews from Google Business written by customers in the words of customers and said, let's create some social media content from these reviews. These ads resonate more with customers because it's the customer's words. Another great uh, set of use cases and, and again, very powerful uh, tools for these things is rewriting, rewriting content. Um, I, got an, I got an NDA from someone and that NDA was in very, very poor condition. It turns out the person who had written that NDA um, kind of copied and pasted it off of Reddit and it was really, really poorly done, so poorly done that I showed it to a human lawyer and, and they're like, ah, no, don't, this is, this is unenforceable, it's terrible. So I handed that to a large language model and said, rewrite this NDA to be legally compliant, to include the features one would normally expect in an NDA. And of course, it came back with a much better uh, uh, NDA that I could then hand off to a human lawyer. They looked at it and they said, yep, this is, this is what an NDA is supposed to say. Um, and so, uh, again, rewriting, taking something that's bad, turning it into something uh, useful. I like to rewrite concepts that I don't understand. Right? These are great educational tools. Uh, we didn't talk about in the technical section, but there are all of these capabilities, that, all these technical features of these models, uh, like parameters and weights uh, that are part of the technical architecture. I asked them, this tool to rewrite this concept in terms of pizza. And it said parameters are like ingredients on your pizza. Weights are like the specific amounts of each ingredients on your pizza. And like, oh, well, now what? That was easy. Now I understand what those technical terms mean in the context of an AI model. And you probably do now, too. Right? That's a very easy way to understand some of the architecture, these very complex concepts and any complex concept. Put it in, ask it to explain it in terms of something you understand, music baking, martial arts, pizza, whatever. The models are very good at rewriting content in, in ways that make sense to you. You can even, <laughs> you can even rewrite these uh, things that you might want to say, but you can't say. So I wrote here the prompt, rewrite the following memo in a professional tone. The memo goes, Bob, you sent over two months of invoices in one day. Of course it's not done. It's not going to be done anytime soon because this takes time. And if you needed it soon, you should let it sit on your desk for two weeks. You can write off and you'll get it when you get it. Go F yourself, uh, Karen in accounting. Of course, the model rewrites it. Dear Bob, I hope this message finds you well. <laughs> I wanted to reach out. Yeah. You can see that the model has taken the substance of the message as angrily as we might have wanted to write it and reframed it into something that would be more appropriate for a professional email. So rewriting a strong capability of these models. The fifth area is classification, taking uh, text data and classifying it, doing stuff with it. For example, I took uh, one of the emails from my Modic instance and I said, categorize this, classify it into topics. What are the topics that are in this email? And it said AI and creativity score of 85, generative AI and marketing score of 80, future of marketing score of 70. And, and then there's some explanations uh, as well. So I could do this with my entire content catalog, with all the content I have in my Modic uh, system and understand you know, the sort of the topics and their relevance. And then if I wanted to, I could take that, put it into a more traditional statistics system and see which topics maybe have the highest open rates or the highest click-through rates in, in Modic. So a very powerful way to classify a lot of content. You can even do things like personality analysis. Uh, here I fed it uh, about 15 emails from uh, a, co a coworker or a colleague, and it scored them on this person's uh, big five personality traits. From a marketing perspective, think about how powerful that would be if you're about to have a meeting with someone and you want to get a sense of their personality, or uh, maybe you have a customer service application where you have previous correspondence with the customer and you're going to hand it off to a new uh, person in your customer service team, this would give them a very quick summary of what, what made personality traits or the tone and sentiment of the conversations you've had in the past to help that person prepare and be ready to deliver customer service that is appropriate to what you know the customer's mood is. 
And finally, question answering. And this is one of the big uses of these models. People just asking them questions like search engines. Even though they're not search engines, people do treat them like that. For example, what are the advantages of the, mark, uh, the modic marketing automation system over other comparable marketing automation software services? You know, and it lists open source, cost-effective, integration, community support, control over data, plug-in ecosystem. If I was doing comparisons of modic versus other systems, this would be a perfectly acceptable answer. One of the key takeaways from marketers is you should ask these tools, these models, what do you know about my company or my products and my services and see what they say. If they don't say anything, then that's a, a whole different can of worms. Now, these tools all sound great. We should immediately go start using them everywhere, right? Well, not so much. Um, there are some risks to these models. This is from OpenAI's disclosures on their website. So they're not hiding this. This is this is um, uh, published and says, you know, for example, we found that our models more strongly associate European American names with positive sentiment when compared to African American names and negative stereotypes with black women. These models have biases in them because they are trained on us humans and humans have biases. So in this example, if you were deploying uh, one of these models with a customer service system and you had a customer named Linda and a customer named Letitia, if it was being used as a chatbot, would Letitia get different treatment than, say, Linda does? Well, according to this bias example, the answer is possibly. And clearly, that's, that's not acceptable. So you want to be careful. You want to be aware that this that is a possibility. One of the big discussion topics right now, particularly in the EU, is copyright. Um, these models are composed of tables of probabilities. We talked about that in the beginning. And that means, in turn, uh, it's very difficult to say what exactly went into them. But we do know a large quantities of copyrighted material went into them. Um, so if you are in a highly regulated industry where um, that could become a, a potential concern, you may want to think about building your own model where you have total control of what goes in it. It will be a lot of work and extremely expensive, but it will be something that you can stand up in court. On the flip side, uh, it, at least here in the USA, the U.S. Copyright Office has said that content generated by artificial intelligence is ineligible for copyright. And the reason for this is that um, it was machine made. Humans did not make it. And according to the laws in the USA, um, only humans can claim copyright. Now, there was a famous case years ago of a chimpanzee that took a selfie and the photographer tried to copyright it and it went to court and it turns out the court ruled the chimpanzee is not human and he, only humans can hold copyright. So that's something to be aware of, one of the risks. The third is that regulation in some fashion is coming. Um, now in the USA, uh, USA politicians are known for um, not being particularly technologically advanced and tending to regulate things in the most, the least helpful way possible. So uh, that's one aspect. Uh, but again, there are cases, for example, like within the EU where uh, the EU as a whole, and I believe Italy uh, specifically is looking at requiring model makers to disclose the, the training data. And if they are unable to or unwilling to do so, they may prohi prohibit their use. So keep an eye on the regulations. How do we use these things? How do we bring them into business? Well, there's four steps, right? There's prompt engineering, where we're just helping people learn how to use these models, prompt deployment, fine tuning of public models, and fine tuning of private models. So prompt engineering is all about just getting these tools into the hands of people and helping them write good prompts, right? Um, write essentially software. They're really just writing software. Um, and getting their, their capabilities up to scratch so that they're able to use these tools. And th you don't just have to use one of the big names. Like As we talked about at the beginning, there are plenty of open source models that run on your laptop, right? You don't need a, a big fancy laptop. You just need a laptop with a decent amount of memory and a, a modern CPU to run locally. And that means that your data never goes outside your laptop. This is an example of GPT for all with the uh, Vacuna model. If you work in things like healthcare, finance, if you're working with personally identifying information or sensitive protected information or you know, protected health information, this is the only option for you that uh, respects and protects data. Um, but these tools are still available. You will see integrations popping up everywhere uh, with these tools. So this is an example of Microsoft Visual Studio Code. I can right-click on some code that I'm writing and have a tool like ChatGPT just check my work and help me find errors and things. So 
as these tools roll out into every piece of software, we're gonna need to make sure people can write effective prompts. Um, later on this year, Microsoft will be releasing Copilot as part of uh, both Windows 11 and Microsoft Office and be able to do things like tell it, create a 10 slide presentation from a press release. A little chat box pops up in any part of Office and you'll be able to, con to interact with a large language model. The same is coming, it's, it's called Duet in Google Docs. Um, so it's Google Docs, Google Sheets, and Google Slides, and Gmail. Um, this stuff is going to be everywhere. One of the most important things you can do right now as a company and as an individual is build a prompt library using the note-taking system of your choice because this is just text, just plain text. You should be cataloging and indexing the prompts that you use and perhaps others use in your company that generate good results and storing them so that you can train other people quickly, you can give them, you know, have a shared prompt library and even protect them. Because think about this. What do we call it when somebody uh, writes something that interfaces with a machine and gets a predictable answer? We call that programming. Prompts are programming. Uh, in Back in January of 2023, Andre Karpathia said on Twitter, the hottest programming language in 2023 is English, right? Or the, the, the plain language of your choice. This is intellectual property. And so you also want to be careful maybe not to share these um, un unless you have permission from your employer to do so because it's the same as sharing source code, right? Even though it may look like, you know, the memo that you wrote to your coworkers asking them not to microwave fish in the break room. Um, when you're writing prompts to these machines, you are writing programming code. The second stage, once you get the hang of prompts, is deploying these prompts. If you find prompts that work really well, you can test them out in a developer environment and see how they perform there and then integrate them into other pieces of software. This is an example. I wrote a, a prompt that did a really good job of sentiment analysis. And now this is included in software that I run. And instead of having to copy and paste a prompt, you know, every time I want to do this, <clears throat> I built it into my code. And now it runs on thousands of pieces of content at a very, very large scale. It's extremely effective. Um, and this is this is how you you generate big results is by using this pro these tools programmatically. The third stage of the, in your evolution is going to be fine tuning, starting the process of fine tuning, and this is um, where you're taking data that you have and teaching a model to be more like that data. You're intentionally putting your thumb on the scale of the probabilities in that model, and saying I want it to be more like this. As an example. I took a bunch of data from our corporate blog, uh, from my CEO specifically. I extracted all of her blog posts, and we fed that into you know, OpenAI's tool and told it to fine-tune one of their models. And then we ran it, and it did such a good job of capturing her tone of voice, her style of writing, way better than a prompt ever does, because we essentially put our thumb on the scale, the probabilities in this model, and said, hey, be more like this. Companies that want uh, to generate really good results, uh, fine tuning is how you're gonna get that. And you're gonna have different models tuned for different purposes. You might have a, a fine tuned model for blogging. You might have a fine tuned model for sentiment analysis, uh, but whatever the case may be, you will teach these models to do business the way you want them to do it. The other advantage of fine tuning is that the more fine tuned a model is, the shorter the prompt. It's a lot like owning a dog. Um, if you have a dog and you train it to sniff just for explosives, uh, that dog will no longer be able to do things like sniff for bombs or, or earthquake survivors. I mean, or sniff for drugs or earthquake survivors. It's, it's tuned towards a specific task. When you do that with a model, you are tuning it towards a specific task and it will do other things less well as a result. It won't write songs or make jokes, but it will do that one task very, very well. And then the epitome of this is companies that will be making their own models fine-tuned, custom fine-tuned models for, for specific applications. Bloomberg, the financial services company, recently did this where they were they took 41 years of their proprietary data and built their own model. It can't tell jokes, it can't write song lyrics, but it can help you predict stocks like crazy and it's built right into their terminal system. So that's sort of the evolution of your progress towards using these, these style of models. Everyone is a developer. When you're writing prompts, when you're writing plain language, you are a developer and everyone in your company is a developer. So you want to make sure that you approach these models from that perspective. 
So how is this going to impact marketing? Well, a bunch of different ways. For one thing, these models all have question answering capabilities. And you will see in these models, you can ask them questions and people will ask these models questions instead of searches. So what does it say about you? Um, you'll notice uh, for some of these things, like here in Google Bard, it will say things that it's correct, but there's nothing to click on. This is not going to generate traffic. In Microsoft Bing, um, it will have here's the same search for my company, and you'll notice the clickable links are kind of little blue chiclets on screen. And my company's the third result from my company, right? LinkedIn and Crunchbase came up first. Um, in uh, Chat GPT, again, nothing clickable. So people will be getting information from these models without necessarily sending, you know, sending us marketers traffic. And the same is true for you know the the private open source models as well. For informational queries that are generic, this the, the models are just going to eat that traffic alive. So, you know, good resources to learn about B two B marketing. You can see there's very very few clickable things. Bing will send you clicks, but that's about it. No one else is going to send you any clicks. So, one of the things that you're going to want to do as a marketer is look at your unbranded search traffic. You know, in in Google Search Console or Bing Webmaster Tools. What percentage of people, uh, what percentage of searches are unbranded and recognize that traffic is probably going to go away. So you'd better have some backup plans. What are those backup plans? Well, there's three of them. One, you need to spend a lot of time building your brand because people will not search for, uh, people will not go to your website for generic information. They will, they will go to you if they know you by name. So you need to invest a lot of time and effort into building a brand that is memorable so that you're always on people's mental shortlist. The second is you need a publishing platform that allows you to stay in touch with your audience without being intermediated by AI. So nothing on social media, nothing in search. Uh, platforms would be things like email marketing, for example, text messaging, anywhere where you can get in touch with your audience without someone else's machinery in the way. And the third thing is to build a community, build a community, particularly in a platform, again, where there's no AI in the way. So uh, come, this is our Slack group, for example, we go to analytics. Uh, this is analytics for marketers. Uh, this is a Slack group, about 3000 people in it. No AI in the way. It's just like a chat room. Uh, if you are familiar with Discord, Discord servers are where a lot of people are building communities now because, A, it's, it's convenient, it's low cost, it's where a lot of people are, and there's no AI in the way between you and your customers. So how do you prepare your career for the artificial intelligence? The, pe the question people always want to know is who's going to lose their jobs? The Brookings Institute said this really well. AI will take away tasks, not jobs. And that is true. What we know is that mach machines are not going to take our jobs. People who are skilled at using the machines will take the jobs of people who are not skilled at using the machines. That is what's going to happen. Because what you'll have is you'll have, um, say, this is your average workday. You're going to find tasks to automate, and those tasks are going to go away, and you'll have a utilization rate that looks like this, where there's you have people who have half their days filled. People who are skilled at machines can obviously keep the, those days filled. And then people who are not, the companies are going to say, well, you know what? We can consolidate some of those tasks and, and reduce some headcount. So you will not directly lose your job to a machine. But if you are skilled at using a machine, uh, you will be able to to uh, keep your job and be more valuable. And this is already happening uh, in America. The Writers Guild of America went on strike in uh, in early May, and uh, within 14 minutes, 14 minutes of that strike, uh, here someone said, "I just got my first inquiry from a studio needing a writer to use some AI to write dialogue." Right? So, so machines are be going to be used to backfill those tasks. Uh, the person who is skilled with machines is going to be taking the job of the people who are not skilled with machines. That is the evolution of the way things are going. So finally, what's next? What's around the corner? The first big trend is autonomous AI. These are, uh, if you think of something like ChatGPT as, as an instance or a, maybe a, a worker, there are software and tool packages now that are creating virtual offices filled with AI workers. This is one called Agent GPT. And these things, given a complex task, will go off and converse with each other, start writing their own software and building 
the infrastructure needed to accomplish the task. Uh, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with things like this. Plan vacations as is one of the more popular examples. Build a short list of vendors and maybe marketing automation software packages that you might want to look at. And there are plenty of uh, very interesting, some concerning use cases for this, but autonomous AI is, is sort of the next big thing. We're even seeing it used in uh, if you're familiar with the video game The Sims, uh, there are now versions where the machines essentially play the characters. So you just sit back and watch these virtual communities, kind of like, I guess, watching an ant farm, but having real conversations with each other. For marketing purposes, this is essentially a synthetic face uh, focus group, which is is would be pretty useful for being able to judge, you know, maybe releasing a new product into market and seeing uh, how people react to it. These machines are getting multimodal. For example, uh, you can have them now write musical scores that are, and then export that as MIDI files that you can then uh, have a human composer work with. Um, they can now recognize images and do text-based analysis of images. This is an example taking some Google Analytics data and having it write a summary of what's in a report. Go search on YouTube for Pepperoni Hug Spot. That's a good example of uh, one of these uh, commercials that was entirely synthesized by AI using voice synthesis, uh, video, etc. Coca-Cola just did their first uh, ad using stable diffusion to generate uh, AI video. Uh, so these things are multimodal. Open source is a big trend, right? So uh, I don't need to tell the Mauda community that, but we are seeing more and more models now that are open source models that are running rings around the bigger models in terms of all the different ways you can use them without some of the restrictions imposed by the larger AI companies. We are seeing ecosystems popping up around AI. So again, models for pretty much any task, like writing stories and books. And even within the, the commercial tools, we see things like the plugin store for a chat GPT that allows you to uh, to bring in other systems and services. So almost like an app store for AI, which is pretty cool. We are seeing things like synthetic marketing, generative AI, where you can have uh, voice cloning, clone the voices of individuals and be able to synthesize content from them. Think about a reluctant CEO who wants to have a podcast, but doesn't have time for it. You can essentially create that for them with their voice and you know synthesize this on their behalf. And models are now exhibiting creativity. Um, one of the things that's happening in research is looking at the mistakes models make, not as bad things we want to prevent them from doing, but maybe as the seeds for creativity. Um, I used this recently and uh, had it generate some, some ideas, some crazy ideas that with these creativity-based AI generators are are different. They're net new. They're not things that they've regurgitated previously because they're taking these randomized mistakes and using them as starting points, sort of like brainstorming. And finally, these tools are getting accessible. They are showing up everywhere. Adobe Photoshop just released their large language model within Photoshop to do uh, generation, text-based generation within the tool. And it's pretty darn amazing. So we are seeing... Uh, in, these tools are going to be in every software package. Perhaps we will even see them in the Modic uh, marketing operation package. So to finish up, everyone is a developer. Now that English is the most popular programming language, or plain language is the most popular programming language, everyone is a developer. Everything you do is potentially software when you're typing prompts to these machines. And every word is an opportunity. The future is here. The future is now. And it's important that we recognize that. If you've got comments and questions, if you want to reach out, I know we're going to have some time for questions, but if you have some other questions you want to ask, uh, if you, you know, remember later or if you want to stay in touch, this is where you'd find me. But thank you and look forward to seeing what we can talk about next. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christopher. Um, actually, this blew my mind. I was... I tried to get ready with some questions. You answered everything what I wanted to ask. And it's really shocking. I thought we we're going to talk about where the singularity will come, but I think it's already here. Like you said, the future is here. Very much so. The, the singularity is here and it's accelerating. Um, what the tools are capable of, particularly the open source tools. So this is something that I've been really... Um, 
adamant about in the last few weeks. Open source is going to be, in the same way that Modic and the open source community is, is accelerating Modic's growth, we're seeing it accelerate AI's growth as well in ways that the commercial services just cannot keep up with uh, because there's, there's just so many thousands of people who are trying to find new applications for these tools. I was playing with one yesterday called GPT Writer that creates a series of instances. Um, you give it a very long prompt and it will write a 20 chapter fiction book and then use stable diffusion to generate a cover for the book, assemble the whole thing. And here's your, here's your book, which is pretty mind blowing. That is shocking. Yeah, that is mind blowing. I'm sure everybody feels like, okay, uh, I will lose my job. So thank you for, for mentioning about the prompt library. I think everybody after this meeting will check out what the, the chat GPT is telling about their own company, how to get the prompt libraries uh, ready and, and start future proofing their, their, own, uh, their own career. What do you think the next huge boom will be? Like what's after this? So the the thing that we're seeing people doing a lot, and I can't tell you what the future is going to hold because it like literally changes with week to week. But we're seeing more I, concepts around uh, semi-autonomous systems or collections of agents, where again, like GPT author that can write a book for you. GPT engineer is probably one of the ones that has caught a lot of people who are in the development space because you essentially give it again a prompt and it, it will engineer say a library of code that it needs to do that job and then and then assemble it. So if you were to give it, say, the specifications of uh, uh, the kind of plugin you wanted to write for Modic, you could give it the specifications it would generate. And it would generate in Python, so you'd have to figure out, like, how do you, you know, transport the final code into PHP? But it would, it would essentially write all that code for you. And so you're now looking at tools that can do feature complete engineering um, in a, I would call it a semi-autonomous because you still do need a subject matter expert to uh, validate and say, okay, this, this is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Very cool. Uh, we have one question here from Rahul. Are there any notable success stories or case studies of businesses using generative AI in building uh, campaigns? Um, not a ton because many of the marketing automation tools out there still do not support generative AI as a control mechanism. So we see, for example, Hub, HubSpot in their chat spot software allows you to query the knowledge base of your CRM to see like, you know, what's the status of my deal pipeline? And I would imagine some enterprising folks within the Modic Foundation are probably looking very hard at, you know, the the models that are commercially licensed like MPT and stuff to, to do the same thing within Modic. But the orchestration part is where software engineering needs to go so uh, we see this with what's happening with adobe right now and with unity where you are seeing prompts appear that you can control the software itself using large language models so the ideal outcome would be something for example like in modic you would open up modic and you say write me a workflow right write me a drip campaign that does these things and then it would go and essentially fire off APIs on the back end to generate that, that workflow and then ask you to inspect it. Um, we do see generative AI being used within campaign content creation. Coca-Cola is probably the most recent high profile example. They use stable diffusion to create a, a mixed video of uh, an art museum, like all these art, uh, famous art pa paintings, um, throwing bottles of Coca-Cola back and forth to each other. So there's there's definitely use in that. The other thing that's very interesting is that a lot of companies do not want to openly admit that they're using AI, but we know it for sure is being used right now to generate ad copy, right? Because no one really likes enjoy, no one enjoys writing like a thousand variations of an advertisement. Um, and in a recent talk with uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Lex Friedman, Zuckerberg said, oh, generative tools are coming to Facebook's ad system so that you, as a, if you're a small business owner, you can just say, all right, make me some ads. I don't know what to write. And it will, it will just generate a whole bunch of them. Amazing. Yeah. I'm so sorry that we could really continue. And the, and the, and the question just started to uh, come in here. There's a very good question, like how we distinguish the, the, the empty hive from the real use cases. Can you give us an answer, a short one? How, like so many, uh, there's so many tools. How do you distinguish gold from the crap? Uh, the fastest way to, to say that is to look at how open the tools are. Like if they're going to share things like model weights with you, they're the real deal. If it's just a bunch of hype and they won't let you talk to engineering, it's probably more hype than real. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, that was every word goal. Thank you so much, Christopher, also for getting up so early. I know it's very early for you. It was an amazing presentation. And dear viewers, thank you so much for your questions. I'll see you in the next session in a minute. Bye.